Good afternoon. Uh, this is Eric Sander, and uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you and my honor to welcome you to this uh, this next edition of the Mechanical and Engineer Aerospace Engineering uh, Summer Speaker Series. Uh, so it really is a pleasure for me to do this today. Um, I have the, the honor of heading the Engineering Innovation Institute here in the Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. Um, you know, I have a background uh, in, in the private sector, so um, came out of the private sector, large companies, Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, Lockheed & Martin, worked at the NASA facility up in Huntsville for a while, started a number of small companies, did a couple of venture funds, and through, and, and the most important thing is I am an alum of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering here at UF, so really proud of that. And very, very honored to be able to introduce our speaker today in this series, J Mr. Jimmy Liu. So I've known Jimmy for, I think, 20 years now, something like that. And so I can tell you that he really is just not only an outstanding gentleman, you know, great representative of mechanical and aerospace engineering, but also very successful as, a, as an investor and attorney before that. So I wanted to give you a little of his background. So Jimmy's currently a managing director and senior partner at the WI Harper Group, which is a cross-border venture capital firm that invests in early stage companies across the US, Greater China and Asia Pacific. Uh, with over 25 years of high tech and venture capital experience, Jimmy Fee focuses much of his time on healthcare related investments. Uh, so before coming to WI Harper, Jimmy had a very successful career as an attorney, uh, most recently at the Acer Group. He was general counsel of the Acer Group where he worked closely with senior management to negotiate and structure Acer's international joint ventures, strategic alliances, acquisitions, global financing, and commercial transactions. Um, before joining Acer, Jimmy was with the McCutcheon Law Firm in San Francisco. Uh, he specialized in uh, M&A, mergers and acquisition and venture transactions, debt and equity financing, and public securities work. He also spent several years covering Fortune 100 companies as a banker with JP Morgan in New York City. Um, so currently, Jimmy serves as a trustee of the PK Young Laboratory School here in Gainesville and is a member of our West Coast Advisory Board here in the Werther, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. And I can tell you that through that function, that West Coast Advisory Board, um, I've been act, interacting with Jimmy uh, at least annually, sometimes twice a year for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. He's been just an incredible, incredible resource to the College of Engineering. So thank you, Jimmy, for that. Um, Jimmy is, uh, attended the University of Florida and went on to complete a Bachelor's of Arts at Yale College, an MBA from Harvard Business School, and a JD from the UC Berkeley School of Law. His father, Dr. Sung Liu, uh, Professor Emeritus, was a renowned scholar that taught courses in MAE for 33 years, 33 years. This family has given more to the University of Florida than any of us could imagine. The Sung and Yvonne Liu Fellowship Foundation was created for outstanding mechanical and aerospace engineering students in 2012. And it really, really is an honor to introduce you to Jimmy Liu, who's gonna give us his thoughts on the fundamentals of tech investing. Jimmy. Thank you so much, Eric. And it's uh, been a pleasure working with you uh, the past uh, many years. And so um, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak uh, with my friends at UF especially those in the uh, Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering, where my father was a professor. I actually had fond memories as a young kid joining my dad in his office at Weill Hall across uh, the football stadium, um, you know, uh, fooling around his office when he had to do work on the weekends and uh, playing around with his office supplies and equipment, his compass, his protractor, his slide rule, and essentially breaking half the things that I touched until my dad said, um, you know, I'm not going to bring you with me to the office on the weekends anymore if you keep breaking things. And so I should have realized back at a young age that uh, the prospects of me being an engineer or a path toward being an engineer uh, was uh, essentially over uh, at a young age. Uh, but um, as Eric uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I am with W.I. Harper. Uh, this is a, a fund with over a billion dollars uh, in assets under management. Uh, we do technology and healthcare investing with offices in Beijing, Taipei, and San Francisco, where I am based. 
Um, we also manage about $100 million of uh, Alibaba's money, uh, focusing on uh, technologies of, uh, that uh, are related to their overall ecosystem. We also uh, have a co-managed fund with a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Kai-Fu Lee, who was a former head of Microsoft China and uh, former head of Google China. And he actually started an incubator accelerator that W.I. Harper had invested as a Series A investor. And we created a fund, $180 million fund, to help bridge companies from a financing standpoint that spin out of the incubator uh, to the first round of venture financing uh, in China. And so uh, Dr. Kai-Fu Li, as many of you may know, is a, a leading visionary and technologist now uh, focusing on the uh, area of artificial intelligence. So today I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about my career path uh, to being a venture capitalist. Uh, it's a very non-traditional path. Uh, and uh, Eric uh, mentioned uh, some of the uh, things that I've done prior to being a venture capitalist. And then also my personal views on the fundamentals of venture investing. Um, uh, things that I've learned over the period of 25 years uh, in this business. Um, Eric mentioned uh, uh, that uh, I uh, had um, worked uh, in a bank uh, where I got my uh, sort of uh, chops uh, uh, in accounting and finance. Uh, but the thing that was very interesting, my first job out of college was being a director uh, of a community outreach program teaching underserved high school students how to operate their own small business. Uh, for those of you that have been in the Boston area, <clears throat> Uh, I actually was uh, employed by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and uh, paid by the bank uh, to teach business classes at a high school called South Boston High. And we would select products to sell uh, and then basically sell products off of a push guard operation at Faneuil Hall Marketplace. This was called the Quincy Market Project. So essentially we taught uh, uh, business concepts to these high school students. Actually it was my the night before learning bookkeeping and accounting and then teaching it the next day and also marketing and sales principles and teaching it the next day at the school hopping in a van with three students and going out and selling our products uh, at Faneuil Hall Marketplace and that's where I caught the entrepreneurial bug way back when and I'm glad that I'm in a position now uh, to work with entrepreneurs, because at that time, I essentially served as a CEO of the high school team, uh, helping to motivate the, uh, the team and then uh, teaching team concepts and uh, helping the uh, students to work together. Um, so in, in terms of sort of my background, the reason I wanted to cover the different aspects of my background as a lawyer and also as a banker is that over the course of the many years, uh, I've been able to acquire uh, the relevant knowledge and skill sets that I think really helps me uh, do my job better as a venture capitalist today. So if you're talking about legal skills, uh, understanding how contracts are written, uh, negotiating terms uh, that uh, as a board member now, helping companies sell uh, to um, uh, potential acquirers. Uh, those are skills that come into play now uh, in terms of finance and accounting, helping the uh, companies doing their budgets and forecasts uh, for uh, a financing round, et cetera. So those are the skills that I've been able to acquire uh, over time. Um, so what have I learned over time? Um, uh, that's what the subject of today's uh, discussion is about. And uh, I'll give you some of my perspectives uh, in terms of uh, being able to transition from the general counsel position to being a venture capitalist, because um, it was after several years um, being involved in more of the strategic uh, negotiations, uh, doing uh, corporate transactions and commercial transactions for Acer, that the chairman uh, gave me and also my partner who had a deep technical background uh, to start the venture arm at Acer. Um, basically, um, at that time, neither my partner or I had uh, venture experience. We did have 
a venture investing experience based on uh, participating in financing rounds when Acer itself was investing in technology companies. But that was the first time we actually formed a venture firm, a fund, and also um, was able to go ahead and learn the concepts of venture capital. We established a good relationship uh, with MIT because Acer had actually been a sponsor of the AI lab at MIT at that time, as well as the media lab. So we were able to get a couple of very, very good investments uh, and the first look at these uh, investment opportunities out of MIT. Uh, for example, and I will probably be touching on my experiences uh, in, in investing in a particular company out of MIT called iRobot. Uh, we were the first investors in iRobot, uh, outside investors in iRobot. And uh, this is the company that makes the Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner that uh, runs around your home, uh, hopefully cleaning uh, uh, your uh, living room and, and hallways, et cetera. Um, and so I can give you some uh, of our experiences investing in a startup uh, until they went public on NASDAQ in 2005. Uh, we also invested in a company called Harmonix Music, uh, which was the co-creators of a music gaming software called Guitar Hero and Rock Band, which we sold uh, to, Har to um, Viacom and uh, MTV Studios. Uh, that's a story in itself because we were in litigation for seven years arguing the, uh, uh, the interpretation of an earnout provision in that particular company and went all the way to the Delaware Supreme Court, but I'll save that uh, discussion for another day. The other um, high profile deal that we did uh, when I was with Acer uh, Ventures uh, was a company that was founded by a UF alum, uh, a guy named by the name of Michael Sheen. Uh, this was a company that he started in a diversified IC uh, company uh, out in the Bay Area. It was called Monolithic Power Systems. Uh, we were Series B and C investors in this company, and the company went public in 2004, I believe, and the stock price was, uh, I think, $8.50. And uh, being a venture capitalist, but not a uh, public company portfolio manager, I sold most of my shares uh, pretty soon after the uh, lockup period was over, and to give you some sense as to how successful that company has been, uh, the most recent price that I saw, the company was, uh, the trading price was $240 per share and has a market cap of $10.7 billion. So I'm sure that uh, the UF Foundation is probably making multiple calls to Michael Sheen these days. Um, but anyway, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, so, um, that gives you some idea of the, about the potential of these companies, uh, starting from uh, just an idea uh, to what they are able to do uh, these days uh, as a public company uh, in uh, the uh, marketplace selling their um, products uh, to uh, other companies and customers uh, demanding their products. So um, uh, going through my experiences and, and being uh, able to uh, give you some sort of lesson learned, let me go into uh, the specifics in terms of the qualities that I think uh, provides uh, the best chance of success for a venture firm, and then also talk about the experiences that I've had with founding teams and entrepreneurs. And so one thing that I think is important for a venture capital firm to be successful is having proprietary deal flow. Uh, proprietary deal flow means um, quality deals that you get that maybe other firms do not get. So you'll probably uh, uh, hear about venture capitalists getting hundreds of uh, business plans and company introductions a week and then being able to vet through those quickly so that you can have uh, your meeting set up to talk more uh, about the value proposition of those companies that you're taking time uh, for those first meetings or first calls. Um, it's a matter of time spent and efficiency uh, because you have so many uh, opportunities and so many investment opportunities and then picking the ones that you really wanna spend some time learning about and also talking to teams. And so that's why it's important to get a good um, flow of good deals, uh, not 
just the quantity of deals that come across your desk. And so where are those deals coming from typically, those good deals? Uh, one source is the entrepreneurial community. Uh, those perhaps serial entrepreneurs that you have dealt with, the ones that you have supported in the past, invested in in the past, uh, that uh, whether they have been successful or not, come back to you with their next idea. And so obviously you're gonna take those calls uh, because you've had the experience working with them. You, uh, you have a lot of confidence in them. They have the qualities of, the, of an entrepreneur that you actually look for. And so those are quality deals that you'll spend time looking at. Other uh, entrepreneurs that may not have had a pre-existing relationship with you may come to you because your VC firm has established a good reputation and credibility uh, in the marketplace, in the industry, where uh, folks, uh, their peers, uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, have been told that uh, we are a good firm to work with. And those are the ones that uh, have been referred to you. And then you will take time uh, to uh, evaluate those particular deals because it comes from a reference that you respect. Other uh, deal sources are from trusted syndicates like uh, other VC firms that you've worked with before. Uh, these are individuals from firms that you have served on the board with. Uh, you have a good sense as to how they manage uh, companies. Uh, they deal how they deal with um, management teams, their investment philosophy. And based on that experience, uh, they come to you with their next opportunity because they respect you and the value add that you bring as a VC. And likewise, you will bring uh, good deals to them. Um, other uh, areas of good uh, deal leads are universities and research institutes. So that means that uh, like, for example, UF uh, has uh, a no shortage of good deals coming out of there uh, from, uh, you know, folks like Eric and uh, the students that he works with, uh, researchers he works with, the uh, folks that the technology licensing office uh, comes across. And so that's how we found uh, uh, iRobot, uh, being able to uh, tie ourselves to some of the uh, labs uh, at MIT. And so there are examples where, like for example, in uh, Stanford, they have uh, a group called StartX. At Harvard, they have the iLab uh, that's focused on technology, and then also the Life Lab, which was created several years ago. And we uh, actually, I serve on a company that is uh, incorporating AI and deep learning uh, in the microbiome space that uh, is focused on uh, drug discovery. And this has been uh, incubated uh, at the uh, Harvard Life Lab. And um, other sources, incubators, accelerators, uh, such as Y Combinator, Idea Lab, Sinovation in, in uh, China, which uh, is led by uh, Dr. Kai Fu Li, and 500 Startups that has US office as well as offices globally. Uh, those are organizations that uh, have programs where they bring in cohorts of new companies uh, that uh, would like to get investments from these accelerators and the accelerators promise uh, an investment of say 150K uh, for six or 7% of the company uh, and then help the company with their ideas, uh, bring experts in for counseling and then uh, get ready for their uh, initial uh, round of uh, investments uh, outside of those uh, uh, accelerators. And then corporate networks, uh, corporations sometimes spin out companies uh, sometimes they have assets like in the uh, life science area, uh, pharmas uh, may have assets that they're not interested in pursuing and therefore uh, uh, venture capitalists and other investors may take advantage of a, an asset that just basically sits there taking over the uh, ownership of the IP and then creating companies and recruiting the right uh, people uh, around this asset uh, to create companies. Um, corporate venture arms are also uh, a source for deals because uh, these corporate venture arms don't necessarily invest uh, in the parent company uh, spin outs, but they look for opportunities for um, companies that have some strategic ties to the parent company and then invest uh, strategically. And they often would like to have a VC, a traditional private VC to uh, invest and lead the deals and set the valuation. And then um, other um, uh, networks are your own personal networks. Uh, so um, 
in, in terms of uh, classmates from college, from grad school, from a professional school, um, trade organizations that you belong to, um, nonprofit boards that you serve on, uh, you get uh, deal leads from all different sources. And uh, sometimes uh, those people that you interact with in those circles uh, are good uh, uh, sources uh, for uh, quality deals. Then um, another um, quality of a, of a VC is being able to spot uh, transformational technologies. Uh, and let me give you an example uh, in, in terms of our investment in iRobot. iRobot, <clears throat> when we were introduced to them, uh, had already been in existence for maybe, I would say, four or five years. Uh, they had done a lot of projects for the Department of Defense uh, and for DARPA, uh, essentially on a cost plus basis. Uh, cost plus basis is not really a venture model, but we looked at their technology and were intrigued by the, those technologies and uh, brainstormed with the uh, founding team uh, to see if there were uh, potential applications in the consumer space. Obviously, this is different uh, from uh, the uh, government uh, uh, tender space and, and the military space, but we felt that uh, the technologies uh, at that time were ripe. Uh, to um, uh, pursue uh, consumer opportunities and to invest from a VC perspective in their company that uh, was creating robots that did dangerous work or dirty work or dull work. And we figured that that is something that would be very, very appropriate uh, for the consumer space. But that uh, uh, didn't necessarily lead to our immediately thinking, oh yeah, there's a thing called a Roomba that you're going to be able to come up with uh, because there were a number of attempts uh, at different uh, consumer products that didn't work, uh, but uh, the company uh, uh, persevered. Uh, the management team was outstanding uh, and we were able to finally come up with a big winner in the uh, Roomba uh, vacuum cleaner. And so uh, that gave us an opportunity to invest in a company that was really in a very, very emerging field. Um, I don't think you had too many companies at that point uh, looking at consumer applications. Whereas now, uh, after like 20 plus years, uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities of uh, robotics companies uh, addressing uh, the consumer space, including many competitors in the uh, 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 robotic vacuum cleaner area itself. So um, being able to spot uh, transportational technologies is good, but then, you know, how do you actually vet those particular um, opportunities? And that's where you get into the due diligence process uh, of looking at the investment opportunities. Um, does the value proposition initially sound realistic or is it just futuristic and you're never going to be able to have enough time and money to come up with a product to sell uh, uh, during your lifetime. And so um, uh, that is something that uh, as we look, or at least our junior people vet those uh, uh, projects that come through by email or ones that are not referred to us, um, be able to quickly uh, look and see whether it's worth pursuing. Um, and then once we uh, start getting a little more serious about the companies, then we go into other forms of due diligence. For example, looking at the technology. Is the technology radically different from what's out there currently? Um, is the um, technology and features just marginally better uh, than what's out there now? Or is it 100 times better or 100 times faster? Uh, or is the cost uh, benefits uh, so much greater that uh, uh, demand will be created in the market uh, immediately. So you have to do your due diligence on the technology. And then what is the technology based on? Uh, is it uh, based on uh, defensible IP? Because then you have at least uh, a leg up on your competition because they, get, they cannot copy uh, your uh, technology. So is the patent portfolio strong? Uh, what is the IP strategy? Is it based on trade secrets? And is that uh, is the trade secret um, basically protected in a way that uh, is not easily copied or easily uh, re reproduced by a competitor. And so um, that's very important, especially when you start talking about uh, technology investing. Um, then you look at the market, you know, how big is that market? <clears throat> is it growing fast? Uh, is there going to be a demand 
uh, from the market. And oftentimes, uh, you know, and not oftentimes, but every time we look at a company and look at the market, we look at the addressable market. And so um, a lot of uh, uh, startups will come and they know that venture capitalists like big numbers. And so they basically say, yeah, this is a $50 billion market opportunity. And, uh, but it turns out after looking at it carefully, it's much smaller than that because their product as they envision it really addresses a very small segment of that market. And then, um, then uh, we basically lose interest because uh, we're looking at fast growing markets and big markets that they can address immediately once they bring their products to market. And so a lot of that uh, comes down to timing. And so I've had a lot of companies that I've invested in that was way, way too early. Uh, you know, probably seven years too early, uh, thinking that, oh, the market adoption uh, for this product or service uh, would be much faster than that. And after spending time and effort and, and uh, resources, um, uh, market just didn't uh, catch up in time. Um, other things to look at, the competitive landscape. And so you have to look at not only the incumbents with a lot of resources out there uh, competing against what you will bring to the market, but uh, the team has to understand, you know, what is out there in terms of um, uh, potential companies that will also introduce new products uh, to the market. Uh, so that'll give you a sense of whether the entrepreneurs really understand what they're facing and also the product uh, roadmap. Um, you're not just investing in a company that has one idea with one product. And then after uh, a couple of years, you're still selling that product and then competitors will then leapfrog you and then uh, sell with better features. So you have to have a product roadmap where the uh, entrepreneurs can articulate just exactly what's the next product gonna be, how they're gonna address the trends um, relating uh, to that particular industry. Then you have to do some due diligence on the business model. You know, what is the go-to-market go strategy? Are you gonna go uh, uh, through distribution channels uh, or are you gonna go direct? Uh, in uh, iRobot's case, uh, they were able to sell their Roombas uh, through the home shopping network, through uh, Hamaker Schlemmer uh, and uh, a Sharper Image. Uh, some of these companies are no longer around, but, but at least in, those, uh, in that period of time, uh, the early adopters uh, were looking uh, at those uh, sort of outlets in terms of buying a product uh, that was quite pricey uh, and still pricey today. Uh, but um, now that was how uh, the Roomba uh, was able to uh, go into the market. We did not want to necessarily work with a Walmart or a Costco at that time, uh, simply uh, because you just couldn't make enough money uh, uh, and, and uh, be able to uh, uh, get into those uh, outlets. Uh, but now, after having established uh, their name recognition and their brand, uh, they are going into various uh, um, alternative markets and mass markets. And then you have to do some financial due diligence, obviously, uh, looking at the projections. And oftentimes in the second meeting, I always ask for forecasts, detailed forecasts, whether it's monthly or quarterly, to see how the company envisions moving forward, not only in the current round that you're investing in, but in the next round to get to the next milestone, whether the milestone is a launch of a product or getting to cash flow uh, positive. Um, those are things that you can question the uh, team uh, and, and uh, challenge their assumptions in terms of, you know, how much uh, resources they need to uh, hire the best people, uh, what uh, additional uh, marketing expenses is needed in, in, to, in order to deploy uh, the product into the marketplace. Um, another thing to look at is uh, who are basically sitting around the table helping out. Do they have a scientific advisory board uh, that actually is dedicated and committed to help uh, counsel the company? Um, uh, do they have co-investors in, uh, in prior rounds that are reputable and credible uh, that can add value as well as you in this particular round? Um, and uh, uh, do, do they have strong mentors uh, for the company? Uh, these are important uh, considerations also. And then, you know, things that may not be seemingly important, but actually uh, is uh, telling uh, is, uh, do they keep good records? Uh, do they uh, have a good data room with all the comprehensive information that you need to evaluate uh, the company? 
obviously, if the company is already in uh, series C or D, they have a history behind them. And it, uh, is the data room complete? Uh, are there missing information, especially uh, critical information that's important for you to do your evaluation? And, and that gives you uh, some sense as to whether uh, maybe the missing information was uh, uh, inadvertently left out or deliberately left out. So um, that's important. Um, also the, the uh, um, return analysis and, and the uh, exit scenarios that you have to uh, look at because uh, you're in the business of investing for your investors, your LPs, your limited partners, and therefore uh, you have to figure out how you're going to make money. And so the way I uh, look at it is, uh, you know, uh, look and see what possibly the company's ultimate exit scenario might be and what that value might be, and then work backwards uh, to see if you are going to be able to uh, get your multiples and IRRs uh, based on uh, that uh, review. Uh, obviously, some other uh, VCs do discounted cash flows and, and other methods of valuation uh, that uh, you know we can't really go into detail at this point. And so um, uh, the, the most important thing in the due diligence process is evaluating the team. And this is probably the most difficult area to assess, especially in the first uh, meeting, uh, first couple of meetings. And so um, <clears throat> many venture capitalists will tell you that, um, you know, if you had a choice of investing in a company that had an A rated technology and a B rated team versus the alternative of investing in a B rated technology and an A rated team, which one would you choose? And most uh, uh, VCs will choose the latter uh, because, uh, and, and this is, much clearer after you invest in a company, uh, how critical it is to invest in the right team. Um, the team, uh, if you invest in a smart uh, a team that uh, has good judgment, that understands uh, the industry, the, uh, understands the market, understands the product and the features that they uh, may have to uh, modify and make uh, the changes in the business model and be able to do that quickly, um, there's no replacement for that. Um, because if you have an A technology and you don't know what to do with it, um, you're gonna be uh, leapfrogged by your competitors uh, at any moment. Um, so you have to really kind of uh, almost uh, assess the, um, the team and see if they have the confidence, if they have the passion, if they have the stamina, if they have the de dedication, the commitment. Um, so first impressions are always so important. And, and so, um, advice to entrepreneurs uh, as you uh, shop your company with uh, to uh, investors is to make sure that um, <clears throat> you prepare well uh, for your first meeting. Uh, your PowerPoint presentation, I counsel this uh, to our uh, companies that I've already invested in, in terms of the next round of investing, is that you come up with a slide deck introducing the company and you basically memorize what you're going to say. Uh, maybe team uh, member A uh, we'll talk about this subject. Team member B will talk about another subject. And then you have backup slides to talk about uh, uh, things that uh, um, VCs might ask for in terms of uh, more details. And then you got to think about uh, whether you're working with an ethical team, a team that has high integrity, and whether they may have higher goals than just making money. Uh, because uh, again, those things are very, very important uh, that you are able to have a good sense before you invest to uh, uh, have a good working relationship after you invest. So I, I see that uh, I do have a, uh, a warning sign from Mike. Uh, I wish that I had actually prepared a deck slide deck for us so that you could look at the uh, uh, information um, offline. But uh, unfortunately, um, you had to put up looking at my face the whole time <laughs> during this session. But there's a number of additional things that I would have enjoyed talking about today, and that is during the term sheet stage, the negotiating of a deal, the amount that you want to raise, the valuation discussions, the key terms uh, of the deal that you want to do. And, and then my bottom line advice there is just to be fair, uh, because if you try to take advantage uh, of uh, lower valuation as a VC, or if you really uh, uh, demand an unreasonable valuation, uh, of a VC and the VC ends up deciding to, to invest, 
uh, it'll come back and uh, haunt you later if you don't meet your milestones. Um, and then I have some advice in terms of how to work with teams after you invest. So um, in terms of adding value as a VC and, and then communicating with a VC team and how a, um, uh, a venture capitalist can work uh, effectively with teams. So, so I think, um, you know, again, uh, I kind of predicted that I would be running out of time, uh, but uh, now, now that I see Eric uh, showing up on the screen, uh, that's another reminder that uh, I should uh, stop where I am now and then maybe uh, be able to go ahead and answer any specific questions that uh, Eric or anybody else has uh, in participating in the session. Jimmy, that's, that's great. Really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Uh, because I think there is, you know, having, having spent a little bit of time in the investment industry, there is so much rich detail that you have that could go beyond this. So in our fall entrepreneurship class, we'll bring you in for a guest lecture on that, probably virtually, uh, if you're willing. And then we'll go into a level of detail. You know, we, we can go as long as we want. Is that <laughs> okay? That's great. Sure, sure. That's great. Look, yeah. I think, yeah, we, we have a lot of questions. Um, but just let me, let me, first of all, thanks. That was a great presentation. You know, as I was listening to, I was kind of actually flashing back to, to, to my days in investment. And, you know, especially I think the, the, the discussion about market disruptors, the addressable versus the overall market, the, the market adoption strategies and, and timing, you know, the, uh, the penetration, market penetration strategies. You know, understanding the value proposition, valuation exit strategies, and then in, in big capital, the team, right? Those things are really important to us, student and faculty entrepreneurs. That, that's, mm -hmm. And that's tough, right? It's tough for students and faculty to kind of work through that, right? Because especially with, with the early stage technologies and companies that, that, that we see coming out of many universities, right? A lot of it is, okay, you know, how, how, how disrupt is this really a market disruptor? And if so, in ways, and, you know, how, how do we, how do we maximize, you know, the potential here? How do we, you know, what are kind of the, the key points where we can, we can do mis risk mitigation? Um, so I think, yeah, look, a lot, I think, in your talk resonated. So look, mm -hmm. questions. Um, and actually, let me start with um, uh, Scott Banks. Uh, and so this is a question actually I had as well. You know, uh, Silicon Valley for, for many years has been kind of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, not only the country, but also the world, right? And I think in a you know, time of a pandemic, where more and more companies, you know, have learned how to interact with their employees, their vendors, their partners, you know, virtually, and, and guess what? In most cases, it's actually worked really well. I think it, it enables new opportunities for or maybe you know investment funds like yours to work with companies at distance. I think there's always value to the face to face. But can you talk a little about you know how you see kind of the current you know, economic and health crisis enabling new opportunities? You know specifically, I think not only in the valley but outside the valley. In other words, is the is the entrepreneurial uh, epicenter of the country really moving? Is it is it shifting? Is it growing? Or is it are we going to go back to where we were before? Well, I think it's already been shifting uh, in terms of uh, not necessarily moving away from Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. Uh, I think uh, the, um, uh, there is so much that the ecosystem has already established in the Bay Area and the uh, uh, educational institutions and the researchers that are based there that it will continue, in my opinion, uh, to lead uh, the uh, sort of the startup uh, ecosystem. But uh, other areas are catching up in terms of the difference in, in, in uh, how far uh, uh, Silicon Valley had built a uh, advantage in the past. I mean, you look at what is happening in China um, and uh, what they've been able to do, uh, copying the uh, system that uh, Silicon Valley has established, not only in terms of you know, the uh, entrepreneurial spirit there, uh, starting new companies, uh, term sheet uh, deal terms are essentially very, very similar uh, to the Silicon Valley. And, and that is based on uh, US dollar investments. Now, B based uh, investments uh, that uh, are uh, 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 made by local companies are, are somewhat different. Uh, the time horizon to exits uh, expectations are a little, little different in that respect. But then you look at uh, 
uh, Israel uh, and what uh, they're doing there. Uh, Eric, you and I talked briefly about, uh, uh, you know, making trips to Israel and seeing what's happening in start of nation there. And I was overwhelmed in terms of what they're doing uh, in terms of, uh, you know, having incubators uh, uh, within uh, 25 miles of each other and competing with each other, getting the brightest, you know, minds uh, um, uh, to uh, join programs there. Um, I've been, uh, you know, I, I visited there, there last year uh, in terms of the, uh, observing their ecosystem and have never been more impressed with the kind of company presentations coming out of these incubators and accelerators. They're well coached by folks who have done this before, uh, who have started companies and their presentations were top notch. And so uh, I think now with uh, COVID and uh, sort of the ability to um, work remotely, uh, we are not talking you know, with teams coming into our office uh, doing face-to-face -face discussions, uh, even though we may be only a few miles apart, uh, but we're on Zoom. Uh, we're doing um, uh, uh, discussions uh, uh, electronically and, and uh, over the over video. And so I think that certainly brings um, sort of the overall sort of uh, concentration uh, of uh, deals that you see and uh, deals done in the uh, Silicon Valley and Bay Area, you're basically uh, able to reach out uh, to other areas uh, much e more easily now uh, because we're all getting more used to uh, sort of uh, doing business uh, over the uh, uh, over video. I mean, just as an example, uh, last Tuesday, I was uh, participating in an IPO kickoff meeting for a portfolio company that is planning to go public on the uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, normally this would have been in person, uh, flying to Hong Kong, uh, but, uh, and because unfortunately of the time difference, uh, I had to stay up till 2, 2 a.m. West Coast time, but um, it was quite productive um, because I, th I think people are getting used to uh, doing business uh, uh, via video. And then the sponsor, the bank uh, sponsor of this uh, um, uh, potential IPO basically would have initially gone out to this company based in Wuhan of all places <laughs> um, uh, to do some initial due diligence um, uh, on the ground. But, uh, and then there would have been additional due diligence uh, uh, things to follow up on, but they basically front loaded a lot of the uh, due diligence matters where they could look at uh, documents, uh, you know, electronically uh, do interviews with management team members and then waiting uh, for that time when travel restrictions and uh, lockdowns were uh, relaxed before actually uh, kicking the tires physically. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a brave new world out there. And, and uh, for some of us folks who have been in this business for a long time, we got to keep, uh, keep up with the times and, and uh, be familiar in how we're going to do business going forward. So yeah, it, it is, I mean, look, from, from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, what a challenging time. But on the other hand, if you look at history, these times just open up innovation, open up opportunities for those that are ready to, to execute on that. And I think, I, yeah. I, I think it's, it is a truly unique time. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, several years ago, uh, having concentrated more on healthcare investments, you know, we were looking at diagnostic companies and and a lot of VCs were just uh, turning away deals in that space because, you know, okay, you di diagnose something, then what happens? Are you going to be able to cure uh, that disease that you diagnosed? Um, no. And then, you know, the economic model was not necessarily attractive. But now you've got a lot of interest in diagnostic companies. You got a lot of interest in things that uh, uh, business models in the healthcare space that uh, focus on remote, you know. Uh, uh, well-being, uh, telemedicine, uh, those companies are now uh, getting a lot of attention. And as I mentioned earlier, robotics. You know, I, I think in the last uh, several weeks, uh, I've seen like four or five companies that are trying to come up with a, uh, a robotic uh, disinfectant machine uh, for, you know, hospitals and, and for commercial spaces. And so, uh, you know, a lot of them have interesting uh, ideas, but you know, is it just a technology where you slap the, the UV light onto a robotic platform? Uh, or is it something really unique 
that you can, uh, you know, bring uh, uh, start a new uh, market out of your product. So, but lots of yeah. innovation, lots of innovation. Yeah, I think I think it it shows how the external environment could so impact the value proposition for a company, right? So, so a company's value proposition, med devices that, 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 you know, maybe they presented a year ago is completely, I think, different than it is today. So let's, I've got, uh, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, so Jimmy, I'm gonna kind of rapid fire them here. Um, from one of our students, Luke, um, I think this is a really good question. What's the biggest mistake you see startups, you know, that you find make, how do you avoid it? And also kind of on the converse side, is there anything that specifically shines when you're looking for a company, you know, in, in which to invest? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, I can't necessarily say what is the biggest mistake, but then, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, lessons learned uh, along the way. Um, you know, looking back, uh, when you get a, uh, a budget or a projection, you always have to be prepared that the company is being optimistic being able to achieve certain milestones in the given sort of time frame and with, with the funds and, and the, uh, the amount that you raise. Uh, and so you always have to leave uh, some money uh, as a cushion uh, in case you don't, because the last thing you wanna do as a venture investor in a particular uh, financing and as a founding team to end up with one month left in cash and going out and trying to desperately look for the next round of financing. So ideally, you will want to achieve certain milestones um, six months out. Uh, so you can start talking to people uh, about uh, what you've achieved from uh, getting that initial round of financing uh, or getting or closing that uh, particular round of financing and, and then uh, talking to uh, VCs and investors. Because um, if you're talking that far out, Investors will be following you. They're not going to invest just six months out and say, hey, sounds great. And then I'm going to give you a term sheet next week. But they're going to look at uh, uh, the uh, company, look at, at the industry, and then also uh, uh, be able to do their vetting and then follow you and from time to time check in. Did you meet the other milestones that you were uh, going to uh, achieve uh, before your next round of financing? Or what's the progress? And so um, I, I think more often than not, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the, the budgets that we receive, we buy into because, you know, I mean, the uh, founding team has a much better idea uh, how much money is going to be uh, uh, necessary to reach uh, uh, the next round of financing with the expectation of a step up in valuation. But uh, a lot of times it just doesn't happen. And so uh, that's one area. Uh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, we uh, uh, make mistakes in, in terms of not being able to challenge you know, the team uh, as much in terms of uh, their assumptions. Um, other, you know, mistakes that we have been able to find, uh, and maybe this is not directly to that uh, question, but just uh, the assessment of the weaknesses and strengths of the team. Um, you know, is this a team that uh, works well together? Or as a team, have they worked together in past uh, sort of interactions? Uh, or was this team slapped together a week ago because somebody just had an MBA, somebody had a science background, and somebody may have some uh, um, you know, uh, interest in uh, doing numbers and then act uh, as a, a CFO. And so you know, it's, it's one of these things where you really have to uh, show that uh, you can work well as a team. The team has the skill sets necessary uh, to address weaknesses. And if you do have weaknesses, admit it up front. And that was the thing that we really appreciated with iRobot because this was an inexperienced team, folks that had started their companies for the first time. They had all the characteristics of, of to be great leaders of companies, uh, but they didn't have the experience. But uh, and, and I have to admit, we didn't have experience as a VC back then either when we first invested, but we worked with them. Uh, plenty of mistakes in terms of approaching uh, different um, products that never went into the marketplace. Um, the, the funny uh, story that I will tell about iRobot was, you know, we had the idea that uh, because uh, you can't do it all alone, uh, bringing a product to market, especially in the consumer area, and create a brand behind it. So we thought the good 
way to approach new products was work with industry partners. So we worked with a very large industrial uh, company uh, for a, an industrial uh, focused uh, uh, three in one cleaner that uh, basically you can deploy in uh, supermarkets and retail stores where, and it's a big giant machine that, you know, mops, uh, uh, cleans, uh, buffs and waxes and buffs. Um, and even with the expertise of this uh, industrial uh, partner that makes those machines, um, it didn't work. The other very interesting story was we worked with a toy maker to create, come up with a doll, um, a, a doll that had sensors throughout the body of the doll. And so if you rub the tummy, it would coo, you hold it upside down and shake it, it would cry. Um, and this is a, you know, the top, one of the top uh, toy makers. And we were relying on them in terms of their perception of whether the market would receive this uh, uh, product. But that was unfortunately a failure too. So, but those were lessons learned. And yep. uh, we uh, yep. ended up, uh, uh, you know, um, coming up with the Roomba. So, um, I forgot the second question you were going to ask, but uh, does I, I think I think you're good. <laughs> let me. Let's, I want to. So let me hit you with with a great question from one of our faculty, but it's a tough one. Okay. Okay. Should I put so myself on mute? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, look, we, we're getting our students get offers. You know, our engineering students get offers from many, many places, right? So. We're seeing more offers from startup companies, right? And mm -hmm. so I've had the, you know, I've been very blessed to, to have worked in startup companies and worked in large companies and in a completely different environment, right? And so, you know, can, can you, what advice could you give to a student as they think about kind of starting their career trajectory? And, you know, there's an option to, to maybe go into a startup. There's, a, there's an option maybe to start their own startup or go into a large company. Any advice that you could give to them? It is so, it's so personal uh, because if you're willing to take the risk uh, and you think you've got a product that you've been researching or working on perhaps with a faculty member and the faculty member and your mentors feel, hey, you got something behind this. Uh, and maybe we can talk to a, an angel investor or let's talk with Eric to see if this has any legs to it. Um, you know, you get feedback that way and then you can go ahead and determine whether, yeah, it's the right time to try that. Uh, and do you have uh, the uh, network, uh, friends and family to give you a little startup cash uh, to work on that idea? Um, do you have the risk profile to work for the startup uh, if you were given the opportunity uh, to work with one? But then you have to do your due diligence of the startup. You know, who are the uh, investors in that startup? Uh, how much cash runway do they have? Um, if they only have six months, but they say, yeah, but we have grand plans. We're going to come up with a, a round of financing in the next three months. And that'll take us another two and a half years uh, uh, to get our product in the marketplace. Well, you just got to do your homework uh, to see what the risks are. Uh, because if you really have that passion, you can take that chance. And if it doesn't work out for whatever reason, it's not the end of the world. Uh, there will be other opportunities. Uh, if you have the right uh, you know, background in terms of uh, your capabilities and you have enough confidence in your skill set, you can always find another position, uh, especially if you go to UF and it's obviously recognized as a top university, uh, you'll be able to you know, tap uh, your network uh, within the UF uh, alumni system uh, to uh, get the next opportunity, whether it's with a, uh, a big company or another startup. Um, but, you know, falling back, uh, you have to do your homework of the, uh, uh, you know, large companies too. I mean, is the uh, opportunity that you're given uh, a project that you think will have legs or is a project that at any day could be cut uh, by corporate because they're cutting back uh, on, you know, resources and uh, that, that's so hard to tell, but you know, that, that just means that you have to talk to more people uh, and, and uh, understand just what the strategy uh, of that uh, uh, particular division of the uh, company uh, is going and whether you think uh, uh, going there would be a safer bet. 
Um, I think it might be safer depending on, you know, just uh, who, uh, what offers you have. If it's a company that's been around for years, uh, continues to innovate, uh, continues to have good programs, uh, picking the best, uh, you know, graduates uh, out of top schools, then, you know, you, you have more faith in those companies. And, uh, and getting experience, I think this is very important. Um, it's like you go to a startup and you may be, you know, uh, be drawn upon your expertise, but then you will probably have to pick up uh, additional uh, responsibilities for the startup that you may not have in a uh, traditional uh, uh, large company. Uh, but in a large company, you may be going deeper in terms of the technology you're working on, which you may over time, and you never know whether you'll have your brilliant idea, you know, a year after you graduate or 10 years after you graduate working for a large company. But when it's time, you probably will know. And with that deep understanding of a particular technology that really can address market needs, you will be able to, you know, appreciate what you've been able to uh, research on and work on and be able to come up uh, with a probably more compelling story when you come up with your idea or with work with a startup team. So it's, That's great. it's really a personal decision. It's a, it's a difficult decision. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but look, as, as, as entrepreneurs, um, I think, you know, we, the advice I give my students is look, you know, do your homework, do your diligence, understand mm -hmm. what you're stepping into. It is a very personal decision that has to do you know, kind of with, with your personality and acceptance of risk. And, you know, frankly, a big part of it, in my opinion, is how much you're willing to bet on yourself. So I've, I've mm -hmm. yep. been in very many positions where I wasn't at all prepared, but I bet on my ability to learn really, really fast. Yep. And I think that is a big part of not only entrepreneurship, but also success in the larger companies as well. And, and as a uh, venture capitalist too, you got to be yeah, able to absolutely. learn fast. Uh -huh. Yeah, you have to learn fast. <laughs> um, so, so along that kind of that line, let me, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm getting many questions, but I want to combine two that actually get, I'm getting. One is from, from Professor Stephen Miller, so one, uh, faculty, and, and then one is from um, a student, um, uh, Jake Samuelson, who's, who's a senior at, at UF right now. And so both of them are asking kind of about, okay, as, as, as students think about, you know, preparing themselves, if they are interested in you know, at least exploring a career, starting a career in entrepreneurship or investing, you know, one of the challenges is how can, how, how are they going to be able to better, best prepare themselves? And so, you know, many students think about, okay, do I need to go get an MBA? Others, you know, think about, okay, what, what kind of skills do I need to kind of build up, you know, that that's on top of, or in addition to, you know, the technical depth that they're going to get in their program within the College of Engineering. And so, you know, students think about kind of how to best prepare themselves if they are interested in, in you know, in, in, in this alternate field. Um, any guidance on, you know, maybe what, how they think about that? Well, I think um, you certainly, I think all the students at UF now uh, going through the engineering program, uh, they certainly have a leg up on, on when I started because I didn't have that technical background. And it's always good to have some technical background because if that's an area that you're interested in, in terms of starting a company or joining a team, you will at least have an understanding of the features of a product, what's important in terms of build a building that product uh, to, be, um, to create that demand in the marketplace. Um, I have to rely, even now, uh, especially in the healthcare space, as I look at uh, um, you know, life science companies, there's no way I'm going to be looking uh, at the structure of a compound and recognize that uh, that's going to be able to, you know, you're going to be able to easily manufacture it or, or whatever. So we have PhDs on our staff uh, that can help with that. And I'm training them to be VCs uh, and they're training me to some level of uh, capability of understanding high level, uh, understanding the science. But in terms of students and what they can get out of uh, uh, their current experience at UF, I would say along two lines in terms of technical skills, and I'm talking about technical skills in terms of business and, and entrepreneurship skills too. Um, that's what I've been extremely impressed with. Every time you, Eric, and, and Cami come back uh, to uh, 
uh, to the West Coast to give us an update on what's happening at the uh, College of Engineering. I'm extremely impressed with, you know, building uh, sort of entrepreneurship uh, in the overall engineering program, because most students at schools that don't have this sort of um, uh, interaction of, of those disciplines, they don't know what's available out there. Uh, they don't know what the, the fact that they can be an engineering major uh, and don't have to then go to grad school or be an engineering major and then immediately, uh, you know, the path to Harris or something like that. They, they have a lot of other options. And I think now, I think your uh, student uh, body uh, appreciates the fact that there are other options like joining startup companies. And now, to the extent that they have this introduction to uh, entrepreneurship and what the other capabilities are to leverage their skill sets, you have courses uh, that they can uh, take. Uh, they can obviously also uh, be part of the uh, Innovation Institute that uh, you, Eric, uh, are heading. And so those are sort of um, ways uh, to kind of know what's out there besides sort of a very narrow path that the new engineer normally takes. And so if they're able to get sort of uh, some exposure uh, to those other options, they may be able to make career decisions in a better way. Obviously, you're out there telling them that uh, this is an option, but you got to have the right character, right personality, and, and risk profile to approach these other areas. But at least you're, you're giving them uh, a good understanding of what other things they may not have necessarily considered. So, and then I think in terms of preparing, I think, and this is something I look back and say, maybe I should have taken more advantage of, but, you know, get to know your mentors, get to know your faculty members, uh, get to know your classmates uh, if you're doing a research project. Uh, and because these are uh, the networks that you're gonna be building later on that you're gonna be leveraging. And those individuals, your classmates gonna be leveraging you uh, based on the trust and relationships you've built. Um, because you're gonna go to those people that you have a lot of confidence that, you're, that you think will help you. And so I think building your, uh, your, your networks uh, is also a very important thing going through uh, your college or grad school experience. So. Yeah, I, I, building that network is so incredibly important. So, so let's, if, if we could, for those that are uh, online streaming uh, through YouTube with us, just a, a time check. I know we're going a little over. We'll, we'll finish here in the next five or so minutes. I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. I hope you can stay with us. Uh, but maybe, you know, just, just one more question, if I could. For sure. Jim. Uh, and this is a tough one. Okay. Um, it's no, always tough from you, Eric. Look, no softballs here. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, it, it's tough, but it's also, so look out into the future, okay? And, you know, the challenge, I think, many times in investing and, and, and you know, you're in a business where you're putting, you know, people's capital into risky propositions that to a great degree are going to, the success or failure of which, I think the number one thing, anybody in the investment world will tell you, I think the number one thing is the team. But then you go beyond the team and, you know, a part of this is really what are the mega trends in technology, you know, so as you look forward, what are the things that are really going to provide opportunity, you know, and, and so as we, we enter now what we call this fourth industrial revolution, you know, we brave new world. Um, any thoughts on kind of where do you see the real technology opportunities, you know, as you look out in the next uh, 10 years or so? Well, I think because of the experience with COVID, <clears throat> I think um, you're going to see sort of the acceleration of innovation that deal with um, digitalization, uh, what you can do uh, in that space. Uh, you can um, see a lot more innovation in the automation space, as we were talking about uh, uh, in terms of uh, robotics, um, and also in the virtualization space. I mean, to the extent that you're talking about uh, the healthcare area, uh, we talked about telemedicine, but also I think um, uh, robotic surgery, you know, where, yep. you know, uh, physicians or surgeons in one location uh, can go ahead and uh, uh, do uh, uh, surgeries in another location. My sort of, uh, what I was telling the one group uh, the other day is that <clears throat> we're gonna get to a stage 
uh, as it relates to robotic surgery, where you're going to have the imaging capabilities of the patient, basically figuring out just exactly how big the heart might be, uh, be uh, where the vessels are, having sensors all around, and a probe that can make uh, that particular surgical procedure minimal, min, minimally invasive, where a doctor or surgeon can do that. Uh, uh, you know, a patient in India that needs it, uh, and, you get, and the doctor is based out of uh, Mass General or something like that. Um, and, and all the preparation in terms of that particular patient, uh, in terms of blood type, uh, in terms of uh, organ features and medications uh, being administered or uh, for chronic uh, you know, conditions, all that's going to be taken into account. And then the surgeon is going to come in and work their little stylus or whatever and, and make those uh, uh, um, uh, surgical uh, operations and, and having the best outcome. You know, uh, so so the combination of uh, you know virtualization, digitalization, and automation, I think, uh, can come together in that kind of example. So that's great. I don't know well, how listen, how uh, soon that will be. <laughs> but, but <laughs> no, you know, the, the good news is when you're projecting the future, nobody can tell you right now you're wrong, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a good place to be. Listen, uh, Jimmy, thanks so much on behalf of everybody you know that's listening in today, and on behalf of the college, the university. Um, this has been really, really great. Um, very, very much appreciate it. We're very proud to have you as, a, as an alum of the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. So, so well, everybody, thank, thanks so thank, much. Yeah, thank you, Eric, for, for the time. And uh, I really uh, appreciate uh, my association with the University of Florida. And uh, I uh, was a Gator growing up and I will forever be a great Gator uh, until the, the time I leave this planet. So <laughs> go Gators. Always. <laughs> Always a gator. So, so for our audience, uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks for, <laughs> unfortunately, we had way too many questions than, than, than we could engage with, but we really appreciate your interest in this. Uh, well, you know, the department will be launching another episode of the MAA uh, speaker series next week. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, and everybody have a great day and stay safe. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>